Good afternoon, and welcome to our webinar today. I know you guys had an opportunity to be anywhere else, and you've chosen to be here, so we really want to use your time wisely. So today's webinar with the Partnership for Diabetes on Health Equity is a part of the Collaboration to Diabetes Health Equity webinar series, which is entitled Best Practices, Next Steps, and Sustainability. My name is Richard A. Gooden, Director of Communications at the National Center for Primary Care at Morehouse School of Medicine. This presentation will be able to be downloaded from the DiabetesHealthEquity.org website. And uh, for the fancy folk out there who are using social media, please um, tag us at P4DHE and use the hashtag BDSCollab. The Partnership for Diabetes Health Equity is headquartered at the National Center for Primary Care, which is headquartered at Morehouse School of Medicine. This project has been funded by the Bristol Myers Squibb Foundation. The cornerstone of the PDHE program is three facets. It's learn, share, and connect. The research principles for the PDHE are working with the clinic, working with the community, and using outcomes to drive the work that's being done. Today we're going to hear a, a lot about various outcomes and the work being done in both the clinic and the community. The learning goals of today are to reduce the risk factors that contribute to diabetes, reduce the complications of diabetes, reduce hospitalization and emergency stays for people with diabetes, improve medication adherence, improve patients' quality life and satisfaction with diabetes prevention and management programs, as well as the satisfaction of those who care for them, provide individuals with self-management support, improve the satisfaction of professionals in their daily clinical practice, and last but not least, improve the health of the population. Just a standard disclosure, in compliance with the ACCME guidelines, the presenters do not have financial or other relationships with the manufacturers or any commercial services discussed in this educational activity. So you guys are going to be in the warm control of <laughs> Dr. Sabrina Jackson. She will take good care of you. She's a clinical instructor here at Morehouse School of Medicine and also the project director for the Partnership for Diabetes on Health Equity here at the National Center for Primary Care. So I give you Sabrina Jackson. Thanks so much, Richard. You also gave me a promotion, I hope, and a degree advancement, since it's how I don't yet have my doctorate. So thank you for that vote of confidence. <laughs> so I agree with uh, Richard. Um, welcome to our audience out there, and particularly for those of you that may be coming back this week from last week. What we wanted to uh, spend a bit of time today talking about were the the best practices that the teams were able to focus on, next steps, and some sustainability ideas that they came up with, but also much of the success of what we accomplished together uh, last year or in that 15-month time together. And um, if I can get all this coordinated, we'll, we'll start out just with a little bit of an introduction. So just in case there are some of those of you today who weren't here last time, to talk a little bit about the framework that we use for this collaborative. Uh, what we did is that we recruited 10 organizational partnership teams from across the country. So for about 15 months, from September 15 through December of last year, we mentored uh, these groups through a process of collaboration. And it's based on the IHI design for their Breakthrough Model Series, which you see represented on this, on this slide. And it really uh, does a good job of laying out the activities and the, the method, not the methodology, but the activity and the schedule that our activities followed. Well, one of the things that is important um, that I want to emphasize is that for our teams, our focus during the time was on diabetes health equity. But we realized that in order to uh, help our teams to create systems that were driving equity, that we first needed to identify the inequities. And so we spent a, a bit of time helping our teams to build this capacity. And I really love this slide because it's a good um, visual of all the different things that contribute to the health potentials of the patients that we, that we face. The other thing that I'd, I'd like to add is that doing this kind of work requires us to really be bold and to be fearless because we have to address some things that are oftentimes uncomfortable particularly when we begin to look at things like policies and things like racism, our patients do struggle with the social determinants. They deal with access and quality issues. But oftentimes, those things are a result of some policies that have been allowed to exist. 
And so what we did is we set out with this concept that we call the three element model of care. Richard alluded to it at the beginning where we, we uh, identified three key areas that we needed to work on. Clinical, so can we uh, design really good clinical, clinical care? where we teach teams how to hone in and improve or create things like diabetes group visits. And then we took another element called home and community, where our patients live, work, play, and pray. And can we help to improve the kinds of things that are happening in the community for our patients, like self-management education or things like walking clubs, community gardens. And then last but certainly not least was our, our data category or what we have on this slide is called outcomes. So things like uh, community, uh, hospital community needs assessments and uh, calculated ED visit rates or hospital, day, ho hospital bed day rates or, or, or total cost of care like from our payers. So can we identify sources of data that can be used as a part of this process? And then we wanted our teams to be challenged to, I think I skipped, skipped a slide. OK, well, maybe I didn't skip a slide. So then we wanted our teams to really concentrate on what we call those in between the lines. So the things that, that need to happen between the clinic and the community, such as can we do a, a diabetes self-management education process, uh, program that the clinic sponsors but it's held in a community center or it's held in, in the basement of a church. And then can a community organization uh, collect some meaningful data and then in turn share that with the clinic? So we wanted our teams to focus on creating processes that would make not only um, the, the big ideas of the clinic, the community, and the outcomes better, but also what's necessary to help work between these lines. Because in our model, what we felt like we can develop is a model that tied it all together, and thus the three element model of care. This uh, collaborative was based on, as I mentioned, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, a collaborative model. Let me, breakthrough series is what it's called. They could disappear. And, and that, that model causes teams to focus on really two big questions, but there is a third one. What are we trying to accomplish? So each of our teams had to create specific aims. And then we, uh, the second question is, how do you know that a change is an improvement? Because we all know that just because you do something different doesn't necessarily mean that it makes it better. So we needed to collect measurements in order to, to really document that our change is an improvement. And then the, the third thing is where we spent our time is what changes can we result that will actually result in improvements that we seek. And that's where our change ideas came from, which was really like a recipe book of, of best practice ideas that um, research had shown and that we'd harvested from the um, Together on Diabetes program to see uh, things that people had tested in diabetes care for minority patients. And so what we did is we taught them to use the quality improvement methodology or plan, do, study, act. And, and many of our teams had never been exposed to this kind of methodology, so we taught them how to do this. So what they would do is that they would need to test ideas before implementing changes. And we're going to revisit that in a little bit towards the end of the presentation. But that gives you the gist of what kinds of things we did together. And so um, what, who we have on the call today, we have three teams that are different from last time. We have our Richland team that's from Mansfield, Ohio. And our members that are presenting today is Kurt, Kelly Burwell, Jill Folk, and then Margaret Lynn. We're also welcoming our Dallas team. And their name changed uh, since we started the collaborative. So please forgive me if I revert back. They used to be uh, the Diabetes Wellness Institute. And now they're called Baylor Scott and White Health and Wellness Center. And so Dr. Sandra Leal was their uh, faculty advisor. Then we have today presenting Ashley Hutto and Kenny Halloran. And then last but certainly not least is our ASL team. That's from ASL, Texas. And they represent the Texas Health Harris Methodist Hospital. And their program was called HELP, which they'll, um, they'll explain to you a little bit later. And, and we have representing that team today Heather Bailey, Melanie, and then Marsha. And so as we get this conversation started today, I'd like to invite our teams to come on and share with you, the audience, a little bit about what they were setting out to accomplish. And we'll start with our 
So hello, and just to give a little bit of background of Richland County, um, we are located midway between Cleveland and Columbus in Ohio, and we are predominantly English speaking. Um, our population is about 88% Caucasian, about 10% African American, and then small percentages of, of other um, ethnic backgrounds. Um, we at Ohio Health um, collaborated with um, Richland Public Health in Richland County. And uh, at Ohio Health, we, do, we already had in existence diabetes self-management education and also diabetes prevention program, um, which are two very reputable evidence-based programs. And we felt that they could be utilized even better. There's a lot of patients out there that could utilize our services that we would like to reach. And by collaborate, collaborating with um, more of a community uh, uh, entity, we had hoped to um, also bring more patients into those programs so they could get those resources. Um, our Richland Public Health did at that time have a primary care clinic, and so a focus was also on referring those patients into those programs um, so that they could obtain those services as well. Um, once they did get into those programs, our hope was that they would improve their A1C levels and be able to self-manage their diabetes and also uh, prevent diabetes. Thank you, Jill. Can you guys hear me? And so now we'll move to Dallas and have our formerly DHWI. <laughs> I got to figure out how, how to some other initials to call you guys. That's a lot to come on and talk a little bit about, you know, your organizational partnership and then the goals and the target population that you wanted to to reach. We are unique in the collaborative insofar as we are a public private partnership and are housed in a community recreation center. So co-located in our building is a full-service primary care clinic, as well as uh, a variety of health and wellness activities and education. Um, and so we have a model where um, we thought we were collaborating really well when we started the program. And, and then, you know, we really were focused on increasing attendance and participation in our self-management education program because we felt like that was really one of the strongest um, opportunities to increase our service to the community. So uh, the community we serve is about 85 percent under or under under or uninsured. Um, they have a disproportionate, highly um, high prevalence of chronic disease, and they are primarily African American. Um, we serve about 60 percent African American and about 40 percent um, Caucasian and Hispanic uh, members. So we really um, embarked on this, uh, feeling like we had a really good. Uh, relationship with all of the partners that are co-located in the building and we're really looking to maximize best practices around attendance and participation. So that's where we started and we will talk to you in a minute about where we learned our, our um, had our greatest learnings. Okay, awesome. Thank you. And then last but certainly not least, we have our, um, our team, Azel to come on and share a little bit about their organization and what they wanted to accomplish. Yes, thank you. This is Marcia Engel. And we found um, th that Azel was a, kind of a challenging area, that, just to describe the community, because that will help you understand our program. Uh, in our emergency room, we're, we're pretty close to Fort Worth, but we're still uh, far enough away not to have any public transportation. Uh, we, we, really don't have access to the, the big centers uh, and the uh, resources that come out of Fort Worth. Uh, so in our emergency room, we are seeing about 56% of the population was either unfunded or um, Medicaid uh, populations. 
And what we found when we, we looked at this particular population is that these patients, they had diabetes, they knew they had diabetes, they knew they were supposed to take medicine, but they couldn't afford uh, a doctor's visit, they couldn't afford the medication. Um, we, we even talked to some that said, yeah, I saved up the money all year to get uh, to go to the doctor. When I got to the doctors, they ordered $400 worth of blood work, uh, and I, I just don't have the money. So they could not get the basic things that they need to get the prescription to manage their diabetes, let alone do stuff like buy healthy foods and so forth. So what we decided was we really needed to dr address these issues with accessibility, but we also needed to address some more of the social determinants of health, because what's the point of teaching people to take their medicine correctly if they can't afford their medicine in the first place? So what we did through HELP and, and our goals of HELP is that we opened this program and it serves primary, well, it serves nothing but uninsured um, patients with diabetes or uninsured patients. We do see patients with diabetes or hypertension. And we generally try to, our, our whole goal is to reduce the barriers that these patients face. And we've done that by creating the community partners. So we have um, mental health, we have uh, eye exams, we have a partnership with, with dent dentists, we have point of service lab work that's done in the clinic. We have telemonitoring equipment we can send with the patient. Uh, they get testing supplies, um, chronic disease self-management resources that are free, uh, individual coaching, prescription assistance. Uh, and then we also, to help address with the, with the food issue, we've, we discovered most of these patients couldn't afford any type of uh, healthy food. So we started a new program in the community, specifically with our community partners, where we would uh, buy bulk fruits and vegetables and divide it out into bags. And then the, the patients could pay for a $5 bag of produce and get about 20 to 25 pieces of produce uh, for, for $5. For our help patients, if they come on a regular basis, we can even give coupons for those patients to get their $5 bag uh, for free. All of this is, is the goal of HELP, which is to reduce as many barriers as possible. Thank you, Marcia. And um, before we transition into the second part, uh, I will say to the audience that on our website, diabeteshealthequity.org, there is a team profile for each of the teams that did participate. We had six teams that completed the collaborative with us. There's a team profile as well as a downloadable copy of the original charters. And their final report where they published what they did together, the kinds of things that they tested, and sort of their findings. In addition, uh, we are compiling a final summative report, which you'll get a, um, an invite to go, on, go online to be able to download it. So I know that today we're taking sort of a cursory look at some of these things, but if you visit the website, then you can learn a bit more about the details of what each team was able to accomplish. And so with that said, I thought it'd be interesting today to, to bring out a little bit about some sustainability, things that resulted from our time together. And so we'll start with our Baylor Scott and White team from Dallas for them to talk a, a little bit about the impact of being a part of this collaborative and what you guys were able to accomplish together. Thank you. Um, so the biggest thing for us in terms of the collaborative and at the highest level was us learning how to do PDSAs effectively and learning how to do them collaboratively. Um, and with that, we ended up drilling down in a lot of spaces, particularly we found out um, that sort of as our, our practice, we had been going straight to implementation on programs and services and best practices and ideas that we had, um, and we were missing a couple of key components. We were missing the PDSA cycles um, to help hone in on what the, uh, the actual deliverables would be on uh, and what success would look like for us in implementing new programs and services. 
But we also realized that there was sort of a, an absence of us having conversations with the people that we were actually serving to understand the impact that changes and implementations would be um, having on them. So as part of this collaborative, we started doing focus groups with our members. Uh, particularly, we did focus groups with members who um, like came to one class and then stopped coming back, or we never got converted from the clinic referral to the class. Um, and so we, we really um, engaged in meaningful conversation and listen to what those community members had to say. And, um, you know, like Azel had, had shared, we found that there were a lot of barriers to their being able to participate. And so we began uh, looking at best practices and looking at what other um, members of our collaborative were doing to implement um, services that would help address those barriers. The other thing that we started doing was collecting and evaluating common metrics. Um, we were looking at certain things in the clinic. We were looking at certain things on the health and wellness side. We were looking at different things um, in our education classes. And so we were doing a lot of evaluation, but we weren't really translating that evaluation into practice. Um, and, and we weren't using the evaluation effectively to help us understand where we needed to go. Um, and so we were able to really um, uh, create common metrics and measures between the three entities um, to better serve the members, but to also um, clarify some of the outcomes that we were seeing. In, um, in engagement with our model. Um, all of this said, it created greater integration for us between our entities, um, and we established uh, regular opportunities for communication and collaboration between our parts. One of the programs that came out of this for us was what we call the Rx for Life. And what we found in our focus groups was that our members were very interested in what the doctor had to say and what the doctor thought they needed to do. And so we created a referral um, form that sort of looks like a prescription pad that says um, the, the doctor recommends that you go to cooking class or the doctor recommends that you go to self-management education classes. Um, and so we put a piece of paper in the member's hands that validated um, their decisions to participate in uh, ancillary programs and services that we offered. And we found that that carried tremendous credibility. So that was just one example of what we were able to accomplish by focusing on PDSAs. Okay, awesome. And my connection is going in and out, so I apologize in advance if you guys, um, if I do go in and out. Actually, I did want to circle back to somebody, and then we have a question, which I'll ask all of you to chime in on. Um, so, so what you're, what I want to be clear to the audience is something that was fascinating to me that you guys, first of all, had a fabulous center that's located in the an underserved community. And in that center, you had a clinic, you had um, a wellness program, and then you even had fitness opportunities. And the three of you coexisted in a building. You knew each other. You liked each other. You said hello to each other. But you had a patient population. You were targeting the same patient population, but you guys were not working together to either track those patients or to share information. And so what is so amazing to me <laughs> is, for one, that that does exist. Um, um, and many of you out there that are listening can attest. But what is amazing to me, though, is that being a part of this collaborative, you guys started to function as one. And I don't know if you can just take you know, maybe one minute to talk a little bit about the difference that is made in terms of gains that your patients are, are able to experience. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, yes, the fact that we have formalized and done more regular communication and collaboration, and the fact that we're measuring uh, the same things and that we're talking about them, 
has really um, it's mm -hmm. increased our attendance in programs. It's increased our um, our markers in terms of like A1C uh, control and blood pressure control and some of the other clinical um, markers that we're looking at that we knew would come with participation and engagement, but the fact that you are able to go to the clinic and um, get your regular um, preventative care, and then you're able to go to our farm stand and purchase fruits and vegetables, you're able to go to exercise class here, you're able to meet with your community health worker, we, we have all of these programs and services in one space, and now we're talking about how to best serve each individual member to get them engaged in a way that's meaningful for them. And you now have an EHR system that allows everyone to see the same thing, and so I'm sure that helps. <laughs> okay, and be before we, we transition, I do want to entertain this first question. And it was it's about the demographics, and I think the question is, maybe did did all of our groups have the same demographics? And so the answer to that is yes and no. All of our all of the groups had a target population that was underserved, so they faced a type of disparity. But amongst our teams, the the target populations varied. With the Azo team, for instance, their um their ethnicity of the groups that they served was Caucasian. Is that correct, Marsha? Correct. So many of um, many of the patients that they serviced were unfunded, and so they were low socioeconomic status. Also, a lot of literacy issues um, in their patient population, but they were Caucasian. Ashley's target population was mostly African American, but you did have some Latino. Is that correct? And then you you, you guys dealt with socioeconomic status uh, disparities. You dealt with literacy issues. Um, was there anything else, any other disparities that were, were identified? For us, transportation was an issue, um, and the ability to consistently communicate with our uh, patients and members, uh, because they're, they're... Okay, so meaning being able to call them on the phone? Right. Okay. And so then for our uh, Mansfield, Ohio team, um, then, then it was kind of everything together. <laughs> So, um, so you guys had some African Americans, you had Latino, any Caucasian patients that you service or targeted? Um, well, we looked in the clinic population, we did look at certain um, demographics that we wanted to focus on. Um, unfortunately, we didn't continue with that population, but um, we are predominantly um, Caucasian English speaking. Okay. okay, awesome. Well, thank you. And then there's another question which we'll, well, I guess we, we could, if you could just talk really quickly about the focus group. I do want to make sure that we, that the other teams get to present too. Sure. And, and topics of the, the topic of the focus groups that you held. So the focus groups were primarily um, a conversation around why do you come, why do you stay, and what kept you from coming, or why didn't you register to begin with? So we asked those questions, um, and, and that really was the focus of our conversation, was what we wanted to know. And we had just, we had two different focus groups. We had an English speaking group, and then we did a separate Spanish speaking class. So um, thank you, Ashley. I, I don't know what just happened, so I kind of feel like I just walked in the room and maybe everybody was talking about me. So, <laughs> but um, we'll transition now to uh, Team Azel to talk a little bit about your, the outcomes, and this is some very exciting stuff. So take it away, Marcia. The focus groups. Uh, I want to address that real quick. The focus groups that we did at Azel. Uh, we we sat down with our target population, which were unfunded diabetic patients going to the emergency room, and we asked them uh, just a, a question: Why why do you go to the emergency room? Uh, are you why are you non-compliant? And we just got a, quite a bit of information from them about um, they're non-compliant because they don't have any other choice, and, and that's when we started identifying these barriers and, and attacking them from there, um, and. That led to the outcomes that we we really are very excited about. Uh, when the average 
person joins help, they had a, a 9.77 A1C. Um, by the end of the collaboration, the help population's A1C was down to 7.34. Um, that was super great. 89% of our diabetic populations either maintained or improved their A1C. But what really helped us, uh, because sustainability is a big issue nowadays, is what we saw uh, through the hospital, through the emergency room. Now remember, our, our population is unfunded. So um, for them, it, it's quite costly through the emergency room and, and even more expensive uh, it, through ICU stays and inpatient stays for this particular population. It's costly for them and it's uh, costly for the hospital. But more important than cost, it's really not a good way to, for these patients to be managing their, their diabetes, to, to wait till it gets to the emergent level, so then we have to put you into the hospital. So uh, through this program, we saw an 81% decrease in emergency room visits a 94% decrease in inpatient admissions for this population, which is a cost savings for us of uh, even after the expenses for help, still save the hospital over 800000 a year. Um, but most importantly, you got a, a higher quality of care. They could manage their, their diabetes and then not um, wait till the emergence level. How did we do this? Uh, the new referral process from the inpatient. Uh, when we first started this collaboration, we did not have a real um, strong relationship. We're, we're actually a department of the hospital, but we're not located on campus. Uh, and so we didn't have a, a real strong referral process. And, and just like the Dallas team mentioned, uh, patients really value what their physicians say. And so we created a prescription pad and, and it gave it to these patients that their physician was prescribing uh, the help clinic to them or the help program. Uh, and that really, really helped get the patients from the inpatient setting to set up their uh, first appointment. And as you can see in our case uh, study, we, we have a partnership with a, a local counseling center. And so that same referral process, once they get to us, then we can use that same referral process to get them over to the, um, the safe harbor. And we had a patient that came in that had a, an A1C of uh, 14. And after three months it helped, it was down to 5.3 because we were able to identify a lot of the other issues that were that were going on. And, and the other thing, and this came from another partner, and I don't remember which partner through this collaboration, and I apologize <laughs> for not remembering the name. I think it was South Carolina. But they gave, I think it was South Carolina too. Uh, they gave mm -hmm. out uh, prepaid cell phones. And so we tried doing that because, uh, again, with Dallas, it's really interesting because Dallas and Azel could not be more different, but our two barriers are the exact same, which is transportation. And we couldn't, we, we just can't catch these patients. They don't have a, help, a home phone or they don't have a cell phone. And so what, um, what really helped us quite a bit was contacting or handing out these prepaid cell phones and for every monthly visit, they got a, a minute card to give them more minutes, but it was only on the guarantee that when we called, they would answer, and that really helped us a lot. You know, these are unfunded patients. They don't like, they don't, we don't have an accurate address. We don't have a phone, uh, phone number. They don't want to give you the phone number because they don't want the billing department to start calling them. So this was a, a great thing for us. <laughs> we could tell them this isn't. This isn't somebody calling you. If we're calling you, it's only about your health and not about your ability to pay. So, so two good questions came in. One was, how do you get patients to come to focus groups when they won't come to class? And then the other one was the funding for the, the cell phones. Um, the, the answer is really both the same. For the focus groups, we gave them a $25 gift card. Uh, and the funding for the cell phones, uh, all of that comes from our foundation. Our foundation supports this program uh, quite a bit. Our community does too. The community gave us a, a significant amount of, of money and, and both of the, um, the cell phones and the uh, gift cards all come from the community donations. 
Ashley, did you have something to add about getting folk out to the focus groups? Um, we did food. So we served um, lunch and dinner to the groups that came. And um, that seemed to be uh, a good motivation. And then we gave away door prizes. And hopefully we'll get a little bit of time to talk at the end, just to, in terms of you know funds for the for the cell phones. A part of you know what you know, I, I, all of these teams figured it out, and I guess we all know deep down inside is that you know the things that we do for our patients need a way to be sustained. And so, what is um, what we have all learned from chasing funds is that those funds eventually dry up and it seems like these days the sources are continuing to dry up. And so, you know, all of our challenges, how do we pay for things? And and I'm convinced that uh, people pay for what matters to them. But the rub comes into is different groups, different things matter. And so when it comes to, you know, our, our care systems and our organizations, we've got to figure out a way to tie it to what matters to them. And most of the time, it's the bottom line. And so data is the best way to tell that story. But it's also the, the area that we struggle the most in. For those of us who are part of healthcare systems, and technically providers, we, we have a little bit of trauma when we hear the word data. You know, <laughs> it terrifies us. And so a lot of the competency in this collaborative was spent around developing um, you know, data, data collection skills and meaningfully evaluating data and then how to take data and tell a story. Like I said, hopefully we'll get, get to that towards the end, but if not, we're going to make sure that we do put out a lot of resources around sustainability ideas um, because a, a small grant could definitely pay for a cell phone, but it won't sustain it. And so, but, but maybe taking data that shows that the patients that you gave a phone to are coming and the way that it's decreased their costs. Small tests of change uh, can be a case for longer studying, which means it has to be funded to do that. So we'll try to we'll try to circle back for it. And HELP stands for Healthy Education Lifestyle Program. Did I get that right? <laughs> All right. So now we're going to um, transition to our Richland, Ohio team. Have them talk a little bit about their, their lasting impact, some of their lessons, and even some of the barriers that they faced. Uh, but they are a strong team that has navigated and are still still together. That's why they're sitting so close, because um, they realize how much they need each other. <laughs> Hi, I'm Margaret Lynn. Um, I represented at, during this project for Public Health. I'm no longer with them, but I was asked to participate in today's um, session. The lasting impact from this project were stronger partnerships. Um, prior to this, Ohio Health and Richmond Public Health didn't have a very close relationship, and so we've really grown to get to know each other and to find out, you know, each other's weaknesses and also strengths, and work off of that and pull in, pull our own partners together. Um, integration of EMR flags for DPP and DSME programs is a big one for us. Um, I think all health systems have this issue, and we had these two great programs, but they were underutilized. And so putting that referral flag up there was huge. Um, expanding community clinical linkages is tied back into that stronger partnership that we had talked about earlier. Um, there were just different programs that each group might not have been aware of. And so we expanded, we tied things together, expanded that. Um, on top of that, our team did go through a lot of ups and downs. Um, you, we talked about a clinic. The clinic at the health department did end up closing midway through the project. And so we had to scramble to figure out, you know, what are we going to do now because our targeted population is changing. So adversity did build strength for us. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on to the next slide and talk about some of our next steps. And then we'll talk about some lessons learned. Hi, I'm Kelly. Um, so I'm talking about some of the cross promotions that we did, and we had a lot. Um, as Ohio Health, Jill and I are both Ohio Health, and with uh, Margaret being with Richland County Health Department, we promoted each other's programs. So Margaret was promoting the DSME and the DPP program, and we were pr promoting for her um, Just Walk, a biking program. They also had a 
water first for thirst. And um, she would, like I said, she helped promote our DPP program. Um, Richland Public Health also, also pro provided to us a wellness prescription brochure that had all these different programs in it, along with um, it would be uh, farmers markets and um, other. Uh, Ohio Health also promotes, or we have a uh, Kroger's tour where people can go and learn about their foods and how to look at calories, uh, how to look at, read the labels. Uh, Richland County uh, Diabetes Coalition was something that the three of us came together and tried to get started. So we are actually doing it. We are reaching out to other, other areas in our community currently. And currently we're working with Third Street with um, community health workers and trying to get something started there where we can all promote each other. Uh, data sharing and tracking, we are tracking things. Um, trying to share data as much as we can, there are definitely roadblocks, being that we are different communities, uh, different organizations. But we try to share what we can, and we try to also promote each other and tell our, the people attending our programs where they can go. Maybe we can't share that information with the organization, but we can at least tell people where to go to get help. Um, we're also utilizing QI tools as appropriately, um, trying to use those. <laughs> Sometimes it's a little bit harder, but we look at all of it as a big picture and try to incorporate things in. And we see also the Richmond County Diabetes Coalition as a good avenue to share some of the QI tools and methods that we learned from the PDG Collaborative, so it's very helpful. Um, the CHWs that we're getting involved with from Third Street is a Third Street is the FQHC, and so previous to this, our relationship with them was a little more distant. And so we've come, we come, we we've come some ways with developing a partnership with them as well. Um, we do not have a slide for for some of the next points I'm going to talk about, but I do want to cover some lessons learned. I know a lot of a lot of people are listening in and wondering what you can do to get started, and it sounds like a big pro. You know, all these things we've done sound like big projects. You really want to find your champions for the team. Um, when I asked Jill to join in on this with me, we had met each other only one time. And I, I got really lucky that she was somebody who felt really passionate about wanting to do this. You know, we didn't get paid extra for this. We didn't get extra grant funding for this. This was just something we wanted to do to improve our program. And then we went through some ups and downs with the clinic. And then Kelly's position was created mm -hmm. for DPP because the previous coordinator had other duties and they decided that they needed someone just to focus on it. And we pulled her right in. And um, you know, you found we found our champions. On top of that, you want to find your executive leaders who are your champions as well. Um, the ones that will pull for you, that will let you go on and take the time to do these initiatives. Make it a win-win for everyone. So, you know, everyone in everyone in this team has something to gain from this. Um, Jill is both a diabetes educator and a DPP, a DPP lifestyle coach, and she wants to see both programs to improve. But she, her main job is to coordinate the DSME program here. Kelly had her DPP program, but she wanted to see um, increasing referrals, and so that's one way to tie it in. And I worked at the time for um, the 1422 grant, and DPP was something that we really wanted to promote. And so we just tied it in. Everyone worked together, and we all wanted the same outcome, so we found each other. Collaborative meetings have to be a priority. And you're thinking, you know, during the year, we always met at least twice a month. And we had calls from PDHE every two weeks. And so we would always either say an hour before or after our calls to make sure that we met as a team as well. And in order to keep that work going, that momentum going, you really need to make it a priority to meet regularly. Also, find out the best avenue for communication whether that's by text, email, phone, Google invite, um, Dropbox, you know, find out what your team members are willing to use. One big thing that I really liked about this um, collaborative was mistakes are OK. And you learn from those mistakes. And we stumbled along the way. And every team has stumbled along the way. But you learn from all those experiences. And finally, data is important. I'm going to reiterate what Sabrina had mentioned. You know, the data makes sure that you're on the right track, that you're measuring what you want to measure. 
you want to make sure you're showing progress. If you're not showing progress, you want to reevaluate where you are. And then another big factor to think about is that this helps you to get your executive leadership on board as well as stakeholders on board. Um, a lot of the PDSA was about doing some pilots. And so if you have a pilot that's doing well and you have the data to back that, to back that up, to grow it into a bigger program, this is the avenue to do it. But without that, you can't um, get everyone on board that's higher up to support you. So that's our presentation. OK, I think I'm back now. Thank you, uh, Richland, uh, Azel, and uh, DHWI, or BSW. I can't remember the other initials. That's just gonna. That's just a challenge for me. <laughs> so we want to um, enter into a, a discussion time and questions for the remainder of our time. I did want to say, though, that there were some questions that came in as part of registration that we really didn't get to address. But I think, but I think that they are important enough that we need to revisit. And so one of the things we've planned is a Twitter chat that will take place uh, later this month. And I have a piece of paper that's going to tell me exactly when that is, because I'm not going to mess this up. So we have a Twitter chat that is scheduled for, um, and now it's too small for me to see the print. It's for June 28th, and it's from 1 to 2 PM. So for those of you that are uh, tech savvy, we'd love to have you join us for the Twitter chat. It's a methodology that we want to start using, too, to, to talk about these conversations, to talk about issues that are coming up um, that you and our audience need addressed. And one of those things is policy. Um, there was a question that came in about best practices that have led to policy changes. And so as part of this collaborative, we did have policy identified as an area that teams could work under. But quite honestly, we didn't get enough time to do it. Our collaborative was a pilot. And we needed much more time to build capacity before we were able to implement a lot of things. Our teams did get to test a lot, but they didn't get to spend a lot of time implementing. And so policy is important because the things that we see taking place ultimately resulted from policy. So it's a very worthy conversation, one that we will revisit. But I did want to um, provide the resources that are on your screen. There was also a question about best practices, sort of how to get recognized. Uh, as a best practice, and what are those steps? And so that's on the screen in front of you. The other thing I'd like to add is that um, one of the best practice models that we used to design this collaborative was based on the Camden uh, Community Coalition that's in Camden, New Jersey. Jeff Brenner, some of you guys out there in the audience know his name. But they actually were able to cause a policy change in New Jersey by creating a Medicaid ACO that so that was a care system that was designed to support patients that social determinants affected their everyday lives. So it's a perfect example of how policy can result when data proves that what you're doing is working. So I can't over, overstate the fact that data is, is money in the bank. And so then there, there starts the confusion what data, how do we collect it, and then what do we do with it? And so we're going to publish some uh, recommendations around data, too. And maybe even a data toolkit may be helpful as well as a, what kind of data is important. But the data will depend on what audience you're talking to. And we have this sort of tongue in cheek uh, thing around here that data tells the story you want it to tell. <laughs> and I guess all of us can look at the media today and know that that statement is true. But the things that you're doing that matter, you've got to be able to prove it. Because that way, it can matter to someone else. You can prove that not only does it matter, it makes a difference. So I'll, I'll put my soapbox away and um, have us visit some of these questions. Um, I think there was a question about the grocery store tours. Um, yes, at Ohio Health, we have two dietitians that have led the grocery store tours, and we've actually been doing them for over seven years. And so just that community promotion um, outside of what we promoted was very helpful to fill up those tours and get more mm -hmm. participants. And a few other things that are kind of uh, rumbling around my brain now. And for our internal staff, if you can note, there also were a few questions that talked about the homeless population. And so that's an area that we need to produce some content. 
to be able to support to be able to support our our participants in in providing resources for patients. That, I mean, for groups that are taking care of the homeless population because we know they're transient. And so there are some models where um, patients are allowed to come in and they get their medicines dosed there. I hate to say it, but it's almost like you know the methadone clinic kind of. Me methods because patients aren't able to store medications and it's not safe. And so some some places have, have developed models where patients can come in daily for their dosing. It does present a problem on the weekend, but you can also use community partners for that. So we will also um, talk about that. And the cell phones work well for that too, as long as you don't have a homeless population that's really transient, meaning they're moving from city to city. It can work that that way, so that's another best practice that can work well. Um, there was another thing I was going to say. One of the things I wanted to point out from the Richland team, and probably from Azel too, is that you know one of the importance of partnerships is leveraging. I guess goals is probably the best way to say it. So everyone has a bottom line, and at the end of the day, we all are accountable that we we should have done certain things, and so part of the challenge uh, for us in building partnerships is finding those where your goals can align. And so that would be, uh, you know, one of the things that Margaret did bring out is, you know, finding people that they're, you know, making it a win-win. But that requires relationships. And so that means that somebody's got to get out of your organization and hit the streets, you know, and find out what else is going on outside of your four walls. And I know that everybody that's on this call today can attest for our presenters, you can attest to the necessity of knowing what's, who your partners are in your landscape. And what's unfortunate is that sometimes previous relationships are frat, you know, they're, they're fractured. And so then the challenge is for you to figure out how do you um, can help to build some bridges is, is what I'm trying to say. So each of the groups represented needed partners. You know, they need people in the community outside of them that can help leverage things. And so um, it's very important to, to reach out from your four walls. But a great way to do it is looking at what do other people need and how can you meet that need first. And I will also underscore the need to have an executive leader that can serve as a champion for you. Because C-suite people can get into meetings that you just can't get into, at least not yet. <laughs> But C-suite people are also sometimes, uh, they play a role in what gets written into the budget. And so that's why you need them on your side. So you bake cookies, you know, find out who's married to who, do whatever it takes to get those people on your team. But in all seriousness, the real way is through the data. When you can prove that your idea works, then they want to listen. So, so I don't know if there are any other questions, but as far as our panel, are there any parting thoughts? before we, we sign off today. <laughs> All of you are like, no, glad this is over. That's my parting thought. <laughs> I, I, I can tell you one thing real quick, mm -hmm. Sabrina. Uh, when, when we proposed doing help, uh, our finance people were standing there going, no, <laughs> that's just not a good, that's just not a good thing. Uh, after a year of, of help and the outcomes that we saw, uh, our finance department is now mm -hmm. our biggest advocates. And, and that's from the data. So the data really, really. And ASIL, which is a part of the larger uh, Texas Health Harris system, is serving as a model. Some of the, the larger cities are looking to them, too, to duplicate what they're doing. And so the data tells the story. So you guys need to get to know those people that are in your population health departments. All data people aren't weird. Let me just say that, you know, so I know you think that, right, Kenny? <laughs> so the data people can become your friends and, um, you know, figure out ways that you can measure what you're doing. And that's why the PDSAs are so important, because they demonstrate in a small scale some things that you're doing. And you can simply test one day of the week, whatever it is that you're proposing. Do it one day of the week and collect uh, outcomes from that. And then do it a different day or propose that way, because that's how you'll start to know that what you're doing is working. Is there a link or a document on help? It, it definitely is. If you visit our website, and if I could have someone on the back end to type in our website, is diabeteshealthequity.org. 
And on that website, if you go under, I think it's under Learn, and you'll see a drop down for the Learning Collaborative. And there's a, a profile on each of the teams, as well as their charter, which displays what they were out to accomplish, and their final report that talks a bit about what they dis what they discover. And there may even be a link to their organization. I'm not sure if that's on there or not. But we can definitely provide that information. So what I think I'm supposed to do now is give you some announcements. So as part of our um, National Center for Primary Care here at Morehouse School of Medicine, we do have a webinar coming up on June 29th that's on Big Tobacco's Interest in e-cigs. And so we'd like to invite you to tune in for that. And then here's the information on the Twitter chat. But we also have a, a few other things coming up as far as PDHE and our learning collaborative is concerned. Uh, our team profiles are on diabeteshealthequity.org. There will be a summative report that um, will be published towards the end of the month that will summarize what our teams discovered as a whole. But it also gives you a, a deeper, deeper dive into this learning collaborative, the methodology, and more of the structure of how it was designed. We are instituting a blog where we will address some of the topics that have come up, as well as some of the things that our teams faced that we believe would be of some help to you guys. And then finally, um, the Twitter chat, which is displayed on your screen. I did identify a resource, and I forgot to mention it to you. Uh, what's so exciting about this website, it's called the Center for Healthcare Strategies Incorporated. And the web address is www.chcs.org. And it's sort of a one-stop shop that gives lots of um, best practice ideas and real-world examples of folk that are working in the space of disparities. So again, it's called the Center for Healthcare Strategies Incorporated. They particularly have good examples of policy a, changes that are being made because of, of work. And it's actually at the bottom of the page. Yep. So if you look at the bottom of the page, you will see in a box called the resources, you'll see the PDHE website, the Partnership for Diabetes Health Equity website. If you click on that, that will take you to the website. There's also another article that um, uh -huh. we have posted as a, as a resource on the integration for uh, best research evidence and clinical expertise and patient values. And then we also have the website that um, Sabrina just mentioned. So all of those are uh, down in the resources um, pod. And we also have the webinar presentation for those of you who are interested in downloading the um, PowerPoint presentation, that's also there for you in the, in the uh, pod right next to it, in the webinar presentation pod. Thank you, Richard. So with that, we will bid you a farewell and good afternoon. I'd like to give a special thanks to our wonderful, able, and capable, resilient presenters. So thank you so much for sharing your experience and your expertise. I will be calling on you again, perhaps, to contribute to our blog. And to our audience, we'll be circulating answers to the questions that you all proposed at registration. It'll probably come in a newsletter format, which we think is probably the best way to do that. And we'll be reaching out to our teams, as well as our faculty that advise them throughout this initiative to um, weigh in on some of your questions and offer resources. So thanks again, and everyone. Lastly, I, Have I like a lovely rest of your afternoon. I wanted to, to take a moment to thank Sabrina Jackson also because she's done a heroic job in, in um, working with all of these different programs and all of these different sites to make sure that you guys are engaged in what you need to and get the outcomes that you need to. So thank you, Sabrina, for your hard work. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. Have a great afternoon.